Dr. Fuad as the head of the accounting department di Ponegoro University, Dr. Agung Juliarto as the head of undergraduate school of accounting di Ponegoro University, to all lecturers from economic and business faculty di Ponegoro University such as Dr. Pujiharto who will be our moderator today and also to all lecturers from other university. I would also like to welcome to all respectable institutes and of course to all our honorable participants. Once again, welcome to Accounting Forum Series with a theme on false research findings. Okay, today we are very pleased, we are very honored to welcome Professor James Olsen from Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Professor Olsen has interest in financial accounting theory, financial statement analysis, equity valuation, and capital market theory. He has lectured around the world and has received various distinguished recognitions and awards, including the American Accounting Association's notable contributions to literature award and many more. And now we are very honored because we are about to listen to his expert opinion about today's all international ceremony in today's seminar. Ladies and gentlemen, next I would like to read today's agenda. No. First, okay. it starts with an opening Just prayer. Maximum then, here. An opening remark yeah, from right. Dr. Richahio as the Diponegori oh. University's Vice Chancellor. Then we make Vice this Chancellor. We will like an opening yeah. remark from Dr. Fuad as the head of the accounting department of the University, followed by starting session from Professor Olsen. And uh, I'd like to remind you that in the, the in the question and answer session, there will be an attendance form that should be filled, which will be shared on the meeting chat. And of course, I would like to remind you again that in today's seminar, there will not be any post-test or pre-test, just attendance form. Let us begin the seminar by praying to the God Almighty based on our individual belief. Pray, pray over. Yeah. Can, did I get, can you hear me clearly? Yes, yes, Prof. Yes, prof. Yes. Did I get that right? You want me to speak? All right. Uh, actually, or, we are, I, I couldn't uh, quite hear you, see. I see. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, I hear. But the, it's part of it is my my own problem. I see. I see. Yeah. So you so, just have uh, to speak a little bit louder and clearer than you should be. All right. Needed. All right. Uh, sorry, can yeah. I make an opening uh, speech first, Prof? I just would like to greet to everyone here, and particularly to uh, other uh, lecturers, uh, professors from Undip and from other universities as well. And I just would like to welcome all of you. And currently, we have received uh, more than 490 registrations from more than 40 universities in Indonesia that they are very interested to join in this seminar. And uh, uh, thank you very much uh, to Prof. Oston. And definitely, I just would like to express my heartful gratitude to Prof. Oston, who joined with us here today and share the important issues on false research findings. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. And of course, uh, Prof. Olson is very famous here in Indonesia. And we are very fortunate to, uh, to have uh, Prof. Olson in this uh, seminar. And we actually plan to invite Prof. Olson uh, directly here to visit Semarang, to visit Indonesia. But unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic here still prevents us to do so. And we hope uh, Prof. Olson still have the ability to come to visit us uh, next year. And uh, this is our last accounting forum series, Prof, that is uh, conducted each month. And we are very fortunate to have you here and to end our uh, 2020's accounting forum series. And we have discussed many, many topics from practitioners to academics alike. <laughs> And we have invited Prof. Tarmizi from Mundip, uh, Mr. Hendro from KPMG, Angelina Liu from Auckland Business School, Zahirul Hawk from Latrop University, and uh, from EY, Mr. Alex Yanturi, and so on and so forth. And definitely, this is a very, uh, very, very interesting, a very uh, nice way to end our accounting forum series in 2020. And I believe that the seminar will be. Uh, fruitful and for rushing for all, everyone present here very interesting topic on false research findings it will open up our perspective on the 
uh, quantitative uh, research in accounting. And thank you very much. Uh, that's it from me. Uh, thank you, Prof. Olson. And pa Vice Rector, on behalf of the Dean, the Dean is not currently very well today, Prof. He sent his regard. He is currently hospitalized and since the last uh, four days, if I'm not mistaken. All right, uh, Brenda, I think that's it from me. Uh, perhaps you can invite Pa Dwi Cahyo as the Vice Rector of uh, UNDIP. Uh, pa Dr. Dwi. Now, uh, Prof. Olson is your favorite author, right? I'm sorry? <laughs> we have Prof. Olson here. Perhaps you can say one or two words to represent uh, UNDIP. Pa Dwi, are you there? Yeah. Is that... Uh, um... Yes, Prof. You're asking me to get started. Did I get that right? Yes, yes, yes. I think uh, it will be better for you to start this uh, session. Please, time is yours. Okay. Yes, I'm happy to be here. I apologize a little bit here because I, it's not as, quite as clear as it should be. And I think part of the problem is my ears. So again, I apologize. Now, just to be sure okay. that... Uh, uh, we all know where we're heading. My understanding is, is I talk for about an hour or so. Is that consistent with what you expect? Yes, bro. Talk to me. Yes, bro. I, I could do it longer or shorter, whatever you want. And then I leave it. And then, of course, it's open for any kinds of questions. Yes. I do not mind. And, yes, bro. Please. Um, I think it's just, it's very good during my talk. You can also uh, ask me questions, of course, uh, but it probably helps the most given how many people are sitting around if it pertains to what you may call clarifying questions. Uh, because it's my experience is otherwise it gets very complicated for the rest of the crew, so to speak. Right. Do you all agree on this? Uh, yes. yes okay, so can I make the slides a bit bigger here? Yes, please. Huh? Yes, uh, we can see the slides clearly. Here. No? Here. Is it clear to everyone now? Yes. Can yes, you no, all no. see the slides clearly? Yes, yes. Okay, so everything is okay. Right, yes. Yeah. Again, just to make sure that there are no issues outstanding that are practical. So, the... Today's topic, of course, is going to be what's on the first slide here on false research findings. And it's a somewhat unusual topic. Um, and it's very rare that you deal with this topic up front. Uh, instead, what you are used to is people present their research questions, research findings, subsidiary tests and everything, and everything is fine and everything is dandy, and we're all supposed to say very, very good. However, to be absolutely sure, this topic is almost always outstanding, of course, at, in academia. However, in my experience, it's become quite bad in economics in general and particularly bad in accounting. My task today is not to convince you uh, that my conclusions regarding this matter is correct. My task today is to convince you, and I want to say this very carefully, somewhat loudly, that as you engage in research, you read other people's papers. And what I'm trying to do is, is just to tell you that, there, that many of these papers you're reading, the conclusion in these papers are not warranted, if not are outright fat, false. You are also going to have this uh, issue outstanding that when you put papers together, the question comes up, am, are my conclusion going to be perceived as being valid? So I'm going to talk about that. What does it take to go through the diagnostic that suggests that papers are in fact unwarranted or in error? 
So that's sort of a very big picture. I would make general comments and I would make specific comments. And again, from your point of view, uh, my, I like to think that the takeaway is going to be that this is a very important topic and you have to be cognizant about it. You have to be aware of it as a reader and also as a producer of research. So here's the motivating literature here. It's a background literature. It's a very large literature here. And what I'm trying to do with this slide is just to alert you to some of the key things that really, I think, should be, every person should be aware of. If you're in finance, economics, accounting, whatever have you, you should be aware of these, right? The first person here that should be mentioned is a guy, it's a Greek name, he's a Stanford University professor, and his, I think I pronounce his name is Ioannidis. Uh, he's world famous. He has written probably the most known paper in the social sciences the past 15 years. You have tens of thousands of downloads. It's published in, in a, a non-refereed stat journal. And uh, the claim here is very straightforward. More than half of all papers published in the sciences in general, he's a bioscientist, more than half of research findings are false. It's a very serious claim, and it's not really viewed as that controversial in many ways, but more than half of all papers are false. So you can think about that next time you sit down and listen to a paper presented, or you read a paper, hmm, now, is this paper false, 50-50, or does it have some validity? The reason, this is not very important in our field because people don't read that much our stuff anyhow, but it's very important uh, from a point of view of Ioannidis' background. He is a Stanford statistician in the medical school and he started out studying drugs and basically he arrived at the conclusion that more than one third of all papers in drug research arrived at false positives. Okay, he also make another point and keep that in mind, folks. Listen to me carefully. It's a very common proposition. Sitting and looking at statistical significant, what I call stargazing, it's never sufficient. You can't just declare victory by looking at, oh, I have three stars. You have to do more things. I would actually argue it one step further. It is not even necessary. Interesting findings should be available even though you do not produce formal stars. Okay, and lurking in the background is a yet another point is, is that you have to keep in mind that somewhere along the line we need materiality tests, which means, hmm, maybe there is something there, but it's really not worthwhile to pay attention to. Yes, it's a judgment call. But don't forget, this is really, really what's going to happen to many young researchers. They start to run regressions. They do all the stuff that you're supposed to do. And then they do not get a nice warm feeling. They're, oh, it's probably <laughs> not enough. So this paper alone, everybody should be aware of. Look, excuse me. I apologize. I have to start over. Is everything fine now? Yes, bro. Uh, ah, I apologize. Okay. You I can apologize continue. A hundred times. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Man, I could be speaking for an hour here to myself. All right. Start. Let me start over. Yes. Okay. The motivating literature. Now I have to speak a little bit faster. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, it's here. I need this 2007. Yes. Very clearly. Huh? Yes. I heard you. Oh, okay. Very yeah. Yeah, so you, that's sort of the please. starting point here. This guy is very famous and he's a Stanford statistician and he's written, a, he's, um, he has uh, uh, written probably the most famous papers in the social sciences the past 15 years or, or more. 
And he claims this is the basic idea that the way we do business and research is that more than half of all papers end up with unwarranted conclusions. Typically, they reject the null hypothesis, and then in the end, when everything is said and done, it's a false conclusion. He makes other points too. Statistical significance is not enough. You can't just look at stars and p-values. And uh, some people would argue it's not even necessary. And then he also makes the point that if you don't be really believe something is going to be very important, you know what? If you look closely enough, that's what you're going to find. Make no mistake. So this is really common sense. But from your point of view, what you want to keep in mind, next time you listen to a paper getting presented, you know, with these and those findings, where you read a paper, half of it, there's probably a 50-50 chance that the paper is wrong. Even famous professors publish uh, false papers. Second site here that I'd like you to pay attention to is one, is a book written by uh, Nate Silver, who is also very famous. It's The Signals and the Noise. He gives you an introduction to why what we're doing is not really going to work. In other words, our classical statistics, which is due to Fisher, he makes the case that this does not really work. If you're serious about conclusion, this is not what you're doing. So you should read that. It is really a rehash of many things that's been around for at least 50 years. And uh, I'm going to try to tell you later on exactly what the problem is and how it can be rectified. But there are worse problems. I also like you to pay attention to uh, a presidential address by, uh, uh, by Campbell Harvey. I think it was just a few years ago. I don't have a year here. It's just a few years old. And it's about so-called p-hacking. And his argument is pervasive. And we should not fool ourselves when we read papers in general. There are good reasons to expect that the conclusion is not valid. So I hope I make these things clear. I'm not talking about new things here. I'm talking about this because I think that you guys who are listening, most of you are not paying sufficient attention to these basic readings and the underlying problem. Finally, I like to refer to a very famous guy. His name is Lemur. He's a senior statistician. He wrote a very famous textbook in 1976. And guess what? I read it. And he makes a very, very straightforward claim, which is just common sense. You cannot look at these statistics without reference to the sample size. It doesn't make logical sense. I will spend some time on this too. But what I'm trying to remind you is a very, very simple thing. With some experience, most of you come to recognize when, I, when the authors claim that, oh, wow, I have, a, I have three stars, I have a t-statistics of 2.8, and then you see that there are 60,000 observations, maybe it doesn't give you a nice warm feeling. Well, there are good reasons. All right, um, so that's the basic here, and more sophisticated, I think all of you may benefit from looking at, at the so-called Jeffries lindley paradox in simplistic terms. It simply says that as the data set increases, classical statistics ends up being a very fragile tool, if not useless. The famous theorem of Jeffrey Lindley says that under certain assumptions, as n goes to infinity with probability one, you shall arrive at the correct inclusions. Most people sort of feel that, you know, if, if I have a, a million data points, uh, shall I look at the p-values or shall I look at magnitude? So this is sort of a very important point here. So this is just general background and um, just try to remind yourself Make a mental note. I probably want to get some kind of understanding of these right. Okay, now more down to earth here. And this, these are the kinds, you don't have to get into the details here, don't worry. 
these are the kinds of things that you're going to run into in the future. They're going to be common. And really what we have here is that people are reviewing prior research. They review it carefully. Then they write up papers. They try to publish these papers, making the case that if you look at the data carefully, the conclusions claimed are false. So this is a very good example. It's just the SSRN paper. And again, uh, they pick something which is sort of fairly well known in our field of accounting. Uh, just look it up here, folks. And it's actually very recent. And basically what we're saying here, way back here in 2005 and 7, the SEC conducted an experiment. All sorts of research came out of it. Everybody loved it because it was a randomized experience. That's what you have in the first sentence here. Now, then they get to find things, one paper after another. Then usually research continues and then they say, yeah, more recently, however, many studies have attributed a wide range of substantive indirected outcomes you know, to this experiment. Now read the punchline. Please pay attention. We revisit the principal findings. In four recent studies, in major journals, using the same sample that closely matches the actual experiment uh, the pre-specified research design. Notice here, pre-specified research design. They don't do any data dredging here. And italics, emphasis, and find no support for any of the reported results. When I read this, I said, I was going to get back to them and say, did you expect anything else? I was familiar with, the with these studies and I had enough of a background. I just rejected them outright. This is not true. And I know what you guys have been doing. And I will tell you a little bit later now today uh, in this talk about what is it that you do to get false findings. But pay attention to this because you're going to see these things in the future. So it's going to be important. Maybe it takes five years, 10 years or whatever, but do expect that people are going to be much tougher. Publish literature. Okay. Uh, so that's what I call on here. Uh, this is as illustrated. All right, uh, can you see the entire slide here? Yes, Prof, okay. very clearly, yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, because I'm losing it here. Uh, what do we have for the, <laughs> okay. So here's sort of the statistics. Uh, I'm trying to. Uh, maybe previous uh, slide. I think we covered the top of the slide. Okay, here are some basic diagnostics. Folks, are you listening carefully now in terms of how I express myself? When you read a paper, you get a little bit bored. Somewhere along the line, if you're a little bit clever, you want to entertain yourself and you ask yourself, I wonder if these guys have been cheating. I wonder if the conclusions are false. So you talk to your colleagues and so forth. And yes, 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 there are some simple diagnostics here. So the first one runs as follows. You can, is, is that sometimes they're very important on variables on the right hand side, which is sometimes play an important role, controlling variables. When you go to the descriptive statistics, you don't find a reference to this variable. And the reason is that they never went back. They, they sort of played around and they found, let's try this and try that. They put it on the right hand side and it works quite nicely given what I'm trying to do, but they don't forget, they forget to update their descriptive statistics. So I sort of amuse myself always looking at, is there anything missing in the descriptive statistics that seems to be important? Now people are aware of this and they're more careful. The next thing, however, is sort of also interesting here. Uh, so I hope I express myself very clearly now. There's nothing surprising about what I'm saying, but you have to learn how to guess. Sometimes when you see regressions, you know, they have 40,000 observations. The MVI here stands for the main variable of interest. So they add the main variable of interest. In other words, 
this is what we're really interested on the right hand side. And we're trying to think that this new variable that is sort of very important in our mind uh, is going to have an impact upon the left hand side. So people come up with very far fetched things like uh, the tax rate has an impact upon on the cost of equity or something like that. So they add this regressions. Now, when you start to look at these things, after a while you start to see these sort of trivial things going on. And often what's lurking in the background, people don't talk about it, but if you delete the variable, the R square will be the same up to three digits. Am I clear? You delete yes, the main variable of interest and the R square will be the same up to the first three digits. So what you can do is to ask the presenter, hmm, if you delete the MVI, uh, what happens to your R square? And then they say, oh, I probably have to check. Hmm, I can't remember. People know very well, they know very well that the R square does not increase. And we have now more than 200 people in the room. I would suggest at least 40, 50 people listening into this. They know personally, from personal experience, exactly what I'm talking about. I also happen to be on the older side. So it turned out that some time ago, people actually used to tell you about these things, but they dropped it out. Why? Not so nice. I don't want to tell people about this. Third thing here, and I hope you appreciate what I'm saying. I'm not saying anything complicated. It's all common sense. And all I'm trying to do is to make aware of these things. And on the way, on the one hand, you can do that as a reader of papers, but it is well to know. You should also think about this when you produce your paper, that there will be people who pay attention to these things. If your paper is shaky, make no mistake, you can pretend that you follow proper procedures, but many people will read it carefully and they see this would not hold up. Okay, number three I, controlling variables. And what's happening often is, is that uh, people always refer to these controlling variables, always for prior literature. I don't come up with references, but it's sort of a prior literature. And basically what people do, of course, they try different main controlling variables and they have to check out which one is the nicest, gives you the best results and the most uh, pleasant thing here. Sometimes, however, you find strange variables on the right-hand side. And sometimes you find that they're obviously on the right-hand side. Then you also find life is tough that sometimes people have controlling variables that end up with the wrong sign and three stars. And then they don't talk about that. But there are some people there that entertain themselves. I'm going to look at the right hand side. And then I find out that they put in size and then the size say, the size seems to have a wrong sign. What do you have to say? Oh, well, maybe I was unlucky. Well, I'm happy for you that, you're, you're, that you didn't have equal bad luck with your, with your main variable of interest. So, but nowadays, papers rare, nowadays people don't raise these signs. It's sort of you bore people. Some people, one strategy is put in 20 right-hand side variables, controlling variables, 20. And before you get to fixed effects, and it says, oh, then people will get, they don't look at it. Uh, so that's what happened. In reality, it's very, very, very rare that you need more than five variables on the right-hand side to fully explain the dependent variable. <clears throat> and amongst these five variables, it does not include the variable you like to see. But people know these things. So keep this in mind when you do your research. These things are known. It is good practice when you learn our business, read papers carefully and try to check up, are the conclusions warranted? And here are the things you can do. Now, this one is a clever one. So there are many things like this you can do, but I really like this stuff here. So I hope 
that your attention is good enough. I hope that I explained things properly. I hope you started to read this two-stage procedure. It is not complicated. It's just a question of my explaining things properly, carefully, slowly. And of course, at your end, you have to pay a little bit more attention than maybe you like to do. But here's the deal. So you have a main variable of interest on the right-hand side, and then you have a dependent variable then you can look at just correlations and you can ask of all the variables on the right hand side, including the main variable of interest, which one has, has the biggest correlation with the dependent variable. So that's fairly sort of straightforward if you have the right table of descriptive statistics. So, they, so you, then you can rank them. So you often you find that the size is very important. Uh, yes, ROA tends to be quite important, and you often find a few things like that is indeed quite important. And then it goes down, and very quickly you find variables uh, that do not have any correlation with dependent variable. Okay, now you're going to the next thing. You do the same thing with t-statistics. Am I clear? So you have all the variables on the right-hand side, then you rank them in terms of t-statistics. What you would expect, of course, is that they closely related to what you did in the first step. Now the question comes up. With respect to the MVI, how does the t-statistic compare to other t-statistics? And you do the same thing. And guess what? Guess what? In the majority of papers, you always find that the t-statistics in the regression tend to be often much higher than things you expect. And then you go to the table of the descriptive statistics, and that's no longer true. Why does this happen? Because people cannot change the bivariate correlation, uh, direct, of course, but they can change the t-statistics by just endless manipulations of the right-hand side which regression do you end up picking? The one with the highest t-statistic. So this is what you expect to find here. So it should be 50-50. So I hope this explained this clearly because it's sort of a fun exercise to go through. And on the other end, you see, I know, you know, everybody knows that you sit in front of your laptop or, or desktop, you run regressions, you run regressions and run regressions, you hit your screen, I'm not getting what I wanted, ah, here is something I can keep. The estimated coefficient is of the correct sign and the t-statistics gives me two or three stars. Under desperate circumstances, I have to take one star. So this is what goes on. Of course, it's become more difficult because the one thing that's happened over the years, which is kind of interesting, very predictable for people like me, that nowadays people often do not show the t-statistic. They show the p-value in the quality size. Why do they do that? Because it's less informative. If you have 40,000 observations and the p-value that less than 1%, it tells you almost nothing about the extent to which the variable helps. And that's the whole point. So people don't show it. Sometimes they show standard errors and that means you have to go through a little bit more direct. I hope this is clear. And uh, uh, actually, I think you're supposed to have copies of the slide so you can sort of read it. And again, rest assured that there's nothing complicated here. It's sort of more or less common sense. And that's important. All right, next thing here. So again here, yes, most people are aware. And this is a very peculiar thing because yes, most people are aware, but let's all agree that we don't bring it up because if we bring it up, then everybody is going to be in trouble. So let's not talk about it. Let's not talk about it. That's the agreement. But you can rest assured two things about it. But there are people who could see this is not really much. Now we're talking about your paper. 
They won't tell you that, but they will see you. In the future, people are going to have to deal with this. And we have dealt with it in the past. And if you want to just remind yourself here of what I had on the first slide, then I had the reference to Lemur. Don't look at these statistics unless you consider capital N. This goes back uh, way, way back. I think even Neyman Pearson and a hundred years ago were well aware of this. But in those days, sample sizes were quite small. So the way they put it was they said, hmm, uh, do I reject the null? Because often what people wanted to do was not to reject the null. They actually want to accept the, accept the null. That's how we use statistics in those days. But now things have changed. Most paper, I think 99% of all papers, they want to reject the null hypothesis. That's what people want. And so that means that let's not look at the T statistics and then see what we have. So let's run through this sort of somewhat carefully and see what we have here. I'm trying to admit, put this forward as an experience issue. I like to think, I like to think that most of you have had this reaction. And it comes to the fact that many, many studies in accounting and finance, especially accounting, they often have N is equal to 40,000. Uh, it's sort of, uh, you know, tw uh, 2,000 firms, 20 years kind of thing. Sometimes it's 80,000, sometimes you get 100,000. But many, many, many studies, if not most studies published in accounting research have at least 10,000 and, and then it goes up. I actually seen some studies of a million observations. Now, that's what we call subjectively. These are data analysis with large. Part of a trick here, and I'm going to get to that later, is so, and you probably know this, is the game of fixed effects. The game of fixed effects is, is that you want to pool all the data and therefore you have fixed effects for, for uh, firms or industries and years. So that means that you get a very, very, very large share. Now, back to the subject here. And I wish I could take a poll. How many of you have read papers, looked at the capital N of 40,000, and then the author who presents the paper says, oh, I have a T-statistics of 2.8, and then he or she smiles, they declare victory. This is what I wanted. My research, my null hypothesis gets rejected, and it backs up my abstract, which says that X explains why, <laughs> holding constant certain things. Now, do you ever have a reaction? It doesn't seem to be quite kosher that a 2.8 is not enough. And the answer is rest assured that all standard theory regarding this problem will tell you that you must consider M. The, the reason we don't do it is traditionally we don't have a firm rule. One can generate firm rules and people don't like to talk about it. And of course, if our business is not that serious, of course, we don't have to talk about it because we don't care about findings that much. Uh, so that's sort of how we firm up this rule here. And the rule, the fact is too modest in my opinion, if the t stat divided by square root of less is point by zero, you can actually use that. But the basic idea is very straightforward, is, is that you can ask the question, <clears throat> which is roughly speaking, what would the t statistic probably have been if I only had 5,000 observations 
Well, maybe it would be in two here. So this sort of comes translate here as a practical matter uh, that is at least six here. Now I can refine this analysis many ways here. So the distribution of n normal zero one is effectively the same as 0 0.3. So you really have a materiality issue lurking in the background. I don't want to say that it's not there, but it's too low for me to be impressed. And it also goes back to the idea that somewhere along the line, the, 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 it's not really a materiality here. There's, there's really nothing going on. It's sort of like this change in R square. I know that your R square has gone from 0 0.0273 to 0 0.0274. I don't care about it. There's nothing. The same, it's sort of the same aspect of it. And then we have standardized, uh, <coughs> and then we have uh, uh, this conclusion here. So I hope you appreciate this because it is a reality. It is not going to go away. There's really nothing you can do about this except be honest. There's a similar thing that I'd like you to pay attention to, which is standardized regressions. I don't know if you heard about standardized regressions, but what you need to do is to look it up. <coughs> you have to look it up, uh, Wikipedia. <coughs> and check what it's all about. But basically you standardize variables, so they have mean zero, standard deviation one. And then what you do is, is that you just estimate the coefficients. And there are very simple rules of thumbs there that if you have something less than 0.05 or whatever, it's sort of like a correlation coefficients, you have nothing. Forget about them, forget about the t-statistics, just estimated the, 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 co the coefficient given that you standardize the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And don't kid yourself, it doesn't help. This has been around for a long time. Why don't people do this? The answer is that if you start to do serious work, you're going to find that all too often, you don't have anything that you thought you had. It's just that simple. But there are ways out of it by a little bit doing things uh, differently. So this is it here. Now, <clears throat> uh, what's going on here, and I'm going to come back to some of these early on here. <clears throat> so much for technical discussion. Now I want to talk a little bit about, <clears throat> excuse me here. <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about the broader issues. What is going on in our business? I'm over the hill, so I don't have to worry about anything. But you guys, on average, and you have lots of young people, you have to try to publish. People will tell you that. You've got to publish. You've got to publish. <clears throat> and then you sort of scout around for topics. And you want to belong. I want to be a scholar. I want to be a recognized scholar. I want people to say, oh, he or she has published. <clears throat> so what you do here is not to look around, this is what I really care about. What you do instead is to ask yourself, I have to come up with a research project. And then you get two forces that come into play. As always, there are always two forces and they push you around. <coughs> So the, first to, the bottom line is, is that you get pushed into far-fetched hypotheses. So the key thing you learn very quickly on here, <clears throat> suppose I have a very straightforward research question, such as, for example, that companies that are highly leveraged, in fact, become risky. So you're a young scholar and you go to your senior faculty member and you ask, this is, I think I would like to do this. I want to check up if, if a company with lots of leverage uh, actually end up being risky. And your, then your supervisor, he or she was, uh, ah, too obvious, probably none. And you get very scared. Oh, because nothing is worse to come in and present the paper and, this, and then people tell you because they want to be patronizing. Oh, we already know this. Oh, it's already been done. And you're supposed to stand there. 
So what you drift into is the other side. I want to find something which is very unique, something nobody has thought about. So that means that inevitably you get to pose far-fetched hypotheses. And often when you listen to a paper and you read the paper, your gut reaction is, this is far-fetched. I never heard of this. And you have people such as myself who for 50 years have been reading Wall Street Journal and I read Financial Times. And suddenly people come up with hypotheses. I never heard of it even remotely. It's a far-fetched hypothesis. If you start to tackle a far-fetched hypothesis, what is the likelihood that something going on that's much? The probability that you or I or famous professors will find something to be the case which is, in fact, the solid conclusion. Nobody heard about it, and everybody says, oh, what drama? Someone found something. Ah, ah, very interesting. The probability is effectively zero. Under the best of circumstances, you can maybe find something there. It is not economically significant. All papers tell you, oh, ours is economically significant. Mm, we know, mm. but we don't believe it. So this is what you're finding. As a young researcher, you often, all too often find yourself that if I do something I can put my finger on and it's concrete, it's likely to be true, then people are going to get back and tell me, oh, we already know this. That is actually not true because the issue at the end is to make things interesting. So this is what you have to keep in mind. It's, it's never going to go away. And my advice is do something which is likely to be true, which is not novelty. And then when someone says, oh, I already know this, just click your heels and says, very good. I believe that you actually believe this. What I'm trying to do is to provide some quantifications so you see how compelling the evidence or are non-compelling the evidence is. That's what you want to do. So if you go to something, again, I have to reveal my old age, like Ball and Brown. Ball and Brown did not do anything that was the least surprising. But it became a famous paper because it provided some compelling evidence that upticks in stock prices correlated with upticks in earnings. And what you did was a certain percentage and so forth. Did he have his paper rejected? Yes, he did have his paper rejected. Did he surprise anyone? No, he did not surprise anyone. But if you read about the paper and you think about the paper, it became a famous paper, I think for good reasons. The same thing is true with many other papers. Don't try to surprise paper, surprise people. Much, much easier to live with the punches and say, yes, I appreciate all of these things because you have to keep in mind. Next time you see someone coming in, presenting something far-fetched, most of the people will not ever remember the paper even one hour after the presentation is over. They don't raise any questions because they don't care. So a necessary condition that people care about the paper is that you get some pushback. And part of the pushback should be, it's not totally new, but there are aspects of it which are sort of new and interesting. So this is my best advice to those of you who have a future. It is true. Okay. Uh, and, <coughs> Then it's also the next thing here. And I want to talk about other things here. Uh, but here's the deal. You can embark upon a research project and all you're going to look for is a p-value or stargazing as I call it, and you're done. Many people do that. The probability that you've written an interesting paper is extremely low. 
So what I always advise people for better or worse, what data analysis would you do if you could not deal with p-value? Think about the following thing. Suppose you're asking with her, you have a, 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 a heads tails experiment. So the question is, what is the probability? So you collect data. Now ask yourself, what is more important, the estimate of a parameter or the p-value? It's almost always, if you have something interesting, it is the estimated value of the parameter. What is the proportion? And by now you're old enough, so to speak, I know, oh, if I have a million observations, of course I'm going to have three stars. And if I only have 28 observations, I probably may not have significance. So that's sort of the nature of the whole thing. The final comment here is, is that the way we do business in our field, in the social sciences, with its mechanistic motivation, research questions, findings, actions, bus this test, all of this stuff. It's not how we do it in the sciences. In the sciences, we do it quite differently because they talk about research issues, the nature of experiment, they collect the data and the findings, then they interpret what they're finding. We have it in some sense backwards. So the so-called research question is really an interpretation imposed upon the findings. All right. Uh, so here are some more comments here for what they're worth. And um, take a look at here what I've written down. Uh, we have about five, 10 minutes or 15 minutes to go here. Uh, so be patient with me. We are coming to an end here. But I, I really sort of like to think that you pay attention here because I like to think that you remember what I am doing. No, it's not what Jim Olsen is doing, but you remember what we talked about, that you put them in your head. You don't push them aside because they're going to be important in your future. Okay, so here's another thing that you have to keep in mind here. And it has to do with the fact that many papers may look very nice. Oh, you know, it's very well written. The tables look good. This English is very good. There's a famous senior author and so forth. And guess what? Many of them, what you see with your eyes is not what you get or read. It's not what you really get. And I like this observation here because it's true in our business too. And people get corrupted, corrupted because I want to belong. There are all these big shots. I can't run around and complain. I'm just a small fry fish here. I'm trying to make a living. I want to be obedient. And if I have to click my heels, I would click my heels. Mm, such a good researcher. The reality is this is not true. Here in Edis, he makes a very interesting observation. Many papers that get repudiated using very good research they still become, remain part of the literature and cited because the people who offered the paper are too important. So you have to learn one thing in the business and you learn this before you graduate. Who shall I cite? I do not want to hurt people's feelings. So I always consider it from that point of view. Mm, this I have to cite it. However, and you guys are from Indonesia, and one Indonesian, she once told me that there's a saying in Indonesia, I hope you take this seriously, or not seriously, which is that you have to keep in mind that a poor person can never bribe a rich person. So the same thing is a little bit true in academia. Don't think that just because you cite some people who are very famous, oh, now I'm going to get it published. No, they are already rich. The key thing is when you do strategic citing, try to find people who are very ambitious and they get so happy to see their names cited and then they are the reviewers and you make a muscle. That's why we do networking. We try to find citation hungry people who are in our line of work. All right, <clears throat> now here's what you want to keep in mind. Serious research, 
and this can always be done when you have large sample, is that you can have a holdout sample. Then you are very clean. It's a very straightforward idea. I have 30 years of data. The first 20 years, I'm going to play around with the data and try to find out how the word works. Then I have an hypothesis. I end up with a specific regression. I think this regression is going to capture reality very nicely. Then you save 10 years of data and then you run your regression. When you do this, you're going to have painful experiences because what you hope to get, you're not going to get. But if you're honest, you can't, you're done. This is what you get. So you're reporting. So you've got to have an interesting question. Uh, so that's sort of really what's going on here. Uh, and again, there's pretense lurking in the background. Now, at this point, of course, I can mention Palmer Macbeth. And Palmer Macbeth is in this spirit. You think something is true? Show me it's true for every year. Then I believe you. So that sort of idea that you split the sample into many things and show that you can get what you want, even for subsamples, and you get it for many subsamples. Why do we have fixed effects? Why? Because we want to avoid doing that. That's why fixed effects read. And some people, it's a very, this fixed effects has its own story. It's a very corrupt business because you have fixed effects for firms, fixed effects for industries, and many of you young people sitting there, oh, we try both. And what do we do? Oh, we check out which one works the best. That's what people do, but that's not serious. So uh, this is it here. And I realize that there are two dicey questions that I want now to come up as an end here. And this is the punchline of my talk. And which are the dicey questions that in the end is lurking in the background. So this is a really talk for the senior faculty members. I think you can listen carefully on this. And as a young man, I never fully appreciated this. But somewhere along the line, we have to appreciate it. We must appreciate it. And um, the first thing is as follows. And again, I'd like you to listen carefully. All you guys have been around. Do we really care if the conclusion is valid or not? Ioannidis and in other field, they have to care. If you do research about the efficiency of drugs, it's a serious matter. Our research is arguably not serious. Senior faculty, you have meetings about whether or not someone should get promoted or hired. Do you ever raise the question, oh, I know he has two or she has two or three. These are published in good journals, but you know what? The conclusions are false. And I think I could even make what they are false. And I heard that they are false. Therefore, it's not that they shouldn't count. It should be a minus. Then what the dean would say, no, we look at publications. We cannot second guess this thing. So this is a very peculiar thing that is ultimately going to come back and haunt us. Are the conclusions, do we care about if the conclusions are? And as it stands here, my best guess is neither producers, reviewers, or consumers lose any sleep over this matter. Papers in journals are presumed to be correct. That's how you young people, address, you know, you are, oh, I'm an accountant, you're Eastern, I'm Indonesia, and so forth. I read a journals. You have to presume they are correct. They are not correct to a substantial degree. How do you think you can live in the long run unless you sort these things out? How do you think it can be... Uh, you don't think that this uh, can sustain you. Now I get to the final issue here. And before I get down to the talk, uh, but now this is sort of a real takeaway here. And none of you know me, I'm a, not a radical person. I don't try to be interesting, but I think what has surfaced is the question of, what is the state of ethics in them? Do people deliberate engage in writing and crafting papers? They know it is misleading. They know that the conclusions are not really warranted. The reality is not talked about. People look at many regressions. There's no reason to suggest that the results are coming. But I have to make a living. Moreover, my suspicion is that most of my colleagues have low ethics. 
because they think the way I do. Most of the stuff we are doing is really not that in. So that's sort of a tragedy that's lurking in the background. And of course, we're going to have to change the incentive system and many things. But for those of you who are young, who expect to proceed for 10, 20, 30, 40 years more in the future, you have to be aware of that this is lurking in the background. And ultimately, it comes back and haunts you. So the final thing then I can talk about is a little bit about it seems remote at first, but it's really, it's a good metaphor. So bear with me. And it has to do with my age. So in the 1980s, in Eastern Europe, things were stirring. The communist countries in the East, in, under the Soviet bloc, they were not doing that. So what happened? Well, it turns out that in some of the countries, you actually have academics. They wrote papers and published papers. This is not working properly. Our economic system is not working. And that was particularly true in East Germany. They knew it is not working. And by 85, you could sit in lunchrooms, senior executives, oh, it's not working what we're doing. And some people, they actually realized I'm going to jump ship. But very, very few people jumped ship because they figured it's going to go on and on and on and on. People always complain and everything goes on and on and on and on. I think much of the social sciences fall into this category. People say, oh, it's prestigious to be a professor. Mm, I like to be a professor. My parents and my husband and my wife are very proud of me. My children are proud of me. I'm a professor. But you know what? What you see now may not last. They don't last the way we have it. And one good example, there are many examples, I studied this, that you can read up the history of academia. So in the 1950s, if you lived in the United States, you could do, go into Freudian psychology. Freudian psychology, wonderful. And people wrote papers. Ah, in New York, oh, I'm a Freudian psychologist, I'm a professor, so this is 1955. No, you're Freudian, oh, very good. You know what? By 1980, it totally collapsed. Why? Because people realized there's no demand for this. Most of the, the stuff is just bullshit. It doesn't have that much to it. And what I'm saying is, is that we have to be careful. The peculiarity in our business is that there is demand for good thinking. There is demand for good thinking. And one of my role models in this regard is someone like Bob Kaplan. He hasn't published much. But there was and is demand for that kind of thinking. The same was true in overall. There's demand for good thinking about, about forecasting, you know, forecasting sales and forecasting profit margins. There's demand for that. There's demand for valuation. Is it easy to publish? No, of course not. But that's a different story. You have a choice. You have a choice. That's really what counts. You can't start to do research for which there is no really good demand. And if that's really no poor demand, that probably will be very poor ethics. Then you join that and hope it lasts. But be prepared. It may not last. So that sort of ends my talk here. And uh, I could go on for hours. And I hope you got something out of it um, to think about. And above all, I'd like to end it with saying that to the extent I said something that's useful and interesting. Remember, I'm well read. It's not because I have some original perspective. I spend more time than most people to try to put it down on paper and talk about it. But it's not as if I'm walking around and people say, oh, is this guy, he thinks that many false findings is very strange. Many people agree with me. Many people agree with me. Well, that's what you have to keep in mind. Um, so that's it. Now, just for the record, I have attached the paper to it. And then I have another fun thing, which is sort of what happens in the seminars. And hope you can get something out of that. So that said, I think all my time has been used up, plus a little bit. So I have to hand it over to uh, the person who is in charge. And yes. I thank you all for having listened. Very nice. I like to talk about these things, as you may imagine. So I hope if you 
enjoyed yourself half as much as I did, then I, it's really been <coughs> successful. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, Prof. Olson. Uh, it is a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, what you just now mentioned. Uh, and I will uh, take over from here as a moderator. I'm sorry if I'm not uh, properly introduced. My name is Puji Harto, Prof. Uh, you can call me Puji. And I will guide and after uh, presentation, we will have uh, some uh, question and answer session. Is that okay, bro? Yes, uh, I'm, I'm very open to any kinds of question, whatever you like to talk about. Always keep in mind that you speak loudly and clearly. Uh, it's not my technology, it's really my age. Okay, bro. Uh, we already have uh, several questions here in our meeting chat. Yeah, Maybe I can uh, read one by one. Yeah. Uh, starting from the question from Mr. Agung Juliarto Undip, and it's a co it's question about should we have clear basis for putting controlling variables in our model? How many controlling controlling variables that suitable in our model, Pro? Oh, I didn't get this. You got to go slower. I'm afraid. Okay. Okay. I will repeat uh, slowly. And the question is, should we have clear basis for putting controlling variables in our models? How many controlling variables that suitable in our regression model, Prof? That is the question. Yes, I think I understand the question. And yes. let me repeat the question first more generally, and then I get some feedback to make sure that I am on track saying something that's meaningful and useful given what the questioner had in mind. So it seems to me that the question lurking in the background is, is that people want to come to grips with what are the controlling variables all about? Yes, yes, bro. That's what it's all about. And then you sort of told that, oh, I'm following the literature. This is bullshit, of course. There has to be some logic behind it. And the logic behind it, in my mind, so that's sort of an excuse, you know, because if you don't have many independent variables, so the, 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 the parenthetical thing is as if you need this, really, because otherwise the paper will not be long enough. So it turns out that they're roughly speaking, forgetting about fixed effects, often you have roughly speaking, roughly speaking, between say 15 and 20 independent variables control. That's a lot. Oh, yeah. So one thing people do is I do what I do. I try many different things, which is sort of in the spirit of what's generally done. And then I wait till I get something that seems reasonable and what I like. That's what people do. So they say, you know, we have ROA, we have losses, growth, uh, book to market, BABA, sales, size and sales growth, and whatever have you. You put this in, and boom, 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 boom. Then you put in interactive effects too, if you get desperate. Interactive effects can be very helpful to switch signs. Then you do this. The reality in my mind is that the first order of business is to clearly explain what does the bivariate analysis tell you? Tell you? Maybe zero, maybe nothing, but you should really, really do that properly. And it turns out as an aside that to do it properly, it should also be done on parametric. And really what you should do, this is again parenthetical, but I think it's very, very useful. You put the dependent variables in five bins. For each and every bin, you tell the reader what the median is. So you get to see the continuity. But the importance of bare variant analysis cannot be done. Then you ask the question, what should I expect to be confounding? So one, so now you should tell people this. The correlation between the main variable and the dependent variable is very low. That's what we expect. But this is the reason we have certain specific confounding variables. Then that has to be spelled out why these variables are confounding. Then you move forward. 
Another way is, is that you have a correlation and then you also have to have a discussion of confounding variables. In my mind, if you do this properly, you should never have more than three or four controlling variables. And I'm a little bit biased. As a young man, the computations were expensive. I was actually told in general, you should never have more, this is sort of the teachers of those days. In general, when you think about how many variables on the right-hand side, never have more than four or five. Okay, <laughs> Things so. have changed since then. <laughs> but the reality is that you have to be aware of that when you line up these controlling variables, the great bulk of them are completely irrelevant. They're completely, that's why people don't like to talk about controlling variables. And then you get the wrong science and so forth. So that's my answer. Shift the analysis and the discussion to bivariate analysis. Once you establish clear narratives about the bivariate analysis, for example, you correlate X and Y for each and every year. Or you correlate X and Y for large firms and for a small firm. You cl clearly explain what the bivariate analysis looks like. Then you have a discussion. You know what? We're confounding issues. I think the confounding issues are the following. Then you have a discussion. That leads to two, three more variables than you've done. If you still find it that you have to search around, then guess what? Make sure you have the whole dog set. So I hope that sort of helps you, my thinking. When you read papers, it seems to be shaky. And when people learn about it, it seems very shaky. You know why it seems shaky? Because it is shaky. Did that help? <laughs> okay, prof. <laughs> And we come to the next question, Prof. Uh, a question from Fakultas Economica. Maybe this is one of the hosts. Yeah? And the question is, uh, you mentioned earlier that there are five diagnostics to figure out whether uh, research is false. So the, all the diagnostics Diagnostic. Uh, oh, I'm uh, losing you. I'm afraid you're losing me. Try okay, again, okay. please. Okay, uh, sorry. Uh, I repeat. I repeat again. Uh, you mentioned earlier that there are five diagnostics to figure out whether research is false. Should all those diagnostic uh, be conducted, or one or two or is enough, or should we? Um, make a diagnostic uh, all five. Well, I don't get it, you see. <laughs> okay, bro. Uh, I don't get it. I, I'm trying to uh, put it in some framework. So yes, I can address yes. It. Uh, can you shorten it up as to first what the what the punchline issue is, and then you go back and give the motivation. What okay. is it that people do or think that you want me to comment on? Uh, should we have to uh, conduct all the diagnostic step uh, to our uh, research process, Prof? Should we have what? Diagnostic, uh, five diagnostic uh, that you mentioned before uh, in your slide. <clears throat> No, Maybe I'm we can recall to the, your slide here. Um, there are more or less uh, a few basic diagnostic. Uh, diagnostic one until uh, eight, if I'm not mistaken. So the, all the diagnostic tests, we have to consider uh, or we only meet one or two from your diagnostic in your Slide, prof. One or two diagnostic uh, in your slide in page five. Yeah, the title is a, a few basic diagnostic. Yeah. Which slide are you referring to? Yes, slide number five. Yeah. five. Let five. me go to five. Yes. Slide five. Okay. okay. Which point are you referring to? Yes. I two I three I. Okay. Uh, maybe I hand over back to the <clears throat> host okay. as uh, one that put the question here. Uh, okay. Mr. Uh, uh, also on. Okay. Uh, there are few basic di diagnostics that you just mentioned earlier. Uh, for instance, the critical. You talking about I? Yeah. These are three diagnostics here. Yeah. Yeah. 
uh, should we fulfill all these five or should we conduct all these fives? No, all you don't do what you have time to do. All I'm saying is that when you write the paper, okay, if you have spare time, you know, often papers are boring, so you look at the tables. I do all of them. All right. I can. Right. But when you write okay. papers, keep in mind these things. I see. This right, one is sort of right. obvious, but people don't, ah, oh, yeah, boring. But the key thing here is, is that when you write your paper, you mm -hmm. often have to do things that doesn't give you a nice warm feeling about what you're doing. Like, for example, why is it that you don't tell me about what happens to R square when you delete the most variable, the main variable of interest? Why is that? because you don't get what you want. So now what you can do, if you have some spare time, is to look into the problem. And what you can do is to ask people, you tell, you, you're running this regression. You're telling me that this is the main regression. Ask the person, what happens to your R square if you delete this variable? Am I clear? Yes, yes. You can do that. And often then people, and I do it a little bit, not any longer for fun. And then people say, oh, I don't know. I have to check, but I'm old enough. Don't bullshit me. But I like to test them out, or I did when I was younger. It's a little bit like sometimes when people present papers, you come to notice they don't really want to talk about the papers. They don't, no, I'm sorry, tables. They don't want to talk about the tables. Why? Because we know they shake you. Right, right. So right. I'm saying is, is that it's just a matter of you alert yourself as a consumer and as a producer of research that these things are going on. I see. That's all I'm trying to do. Right. You can't avoid all of these things. By being really, really honest and forthcoming, use a proper hold up sample, use something like Pharma Macbeth and whatever have you. And above all, recognize findings may be ambiguous. It's sort of a little bit like when you read most papers, have you noticed that robustness tests always work out? Am I clear? Yep, yep. Have you uh, noticed that? Yeah. Do you believe that's true? No, you uh, do not. Am I right? Yes, yes. So the it means thing it's is, is that every time uh, nowadays you're told, is it economically significant? And then you shut off and you know, yeah, of course it is. It's always economically significant. Well, it turns out that economic significance, the way you do it, if you do some pushing around, you always find it. Don't bore me. Instead, I would feel a bit better if someone came in and said, Oh, we tried six different robustness tests and we were very disappointed. Two of them did not work out. Did you ever hear that? Yes. Did you? Yeah. Uh, uh, so it means that uh, this will provide us with the tools in order to diagnose. Yes, it will provide you with the broader insights that you got to have a perspective on what you're doing. I see. That's what it's all about. In other words, the way I think about it when people ask me about things, uh, when I always say this is a fun thing, the extent to which you want to fool other people, it's up to you. But don't ever fool yourself. Don't All fool right. you. Very clear. Then you can decide how you want to go ahead and fool other people. It's okay, it's yours. No, I'm serious. Yeah, yeah. Yes. It's life. So that's what it comes down to, in other words. But what I'm saying is, is don't fool yourself. And then you come to realize, be aware of that people can be quiet. It doesn't mean that they don't see what you're doing. Hmm. If you've been having low quality conclusions and people don't complain, don't feel that you're doing okay. You can't be sure that you have people, they see exactly what you're doing. But that doesn't mean they come up and tell you. Hmm. 
Right. So they that may is... see here, there's nothing going on in this paper. I know exactly what he's doing. They don't come up and tell you, you know, I think your results are very weak. No, they leave the seminar room, turn off and then go have a coffee. Think about something else. All right. So that's sort of a part of my problem. Part of my objective today is to make you aware of things. Yes. Yeah. Then you can arrive at your own conclusions how to behave. Okay, Prof. Uh, I hope that's clear. Yep. But I like that expression. One thing is, is what you, how you fool other people. That's up to you. But never fool yourself. Just don't okay. do it. Okay. Uh, Mr. Fuad, it's okay. Uh, yeah, very clear. Okay. Clear as crystal. Very, thank, thank you very you. much, Prof. Okay, then we can move to the next question, Prof. Uh, the question is, what should the researcher do when a strong hypothesis uh, is statistically rejected? It means that cannot uh, reject the null hypothesis. Should he must be frustrated or there, is there any uh, best alternative on that? The only way out of things is to be A, totally honest and B, listen carefully. Try to phrase a question such that you do not have to worry about finding A as opposed to B. You're indifferent. In other words, if you work with a very interesting question, then you shouldn't have to worry about what you're finding. What you worry about is I want to do it right. And you should be comfortable with the idea that if I do things right, under certain conditions, under certain ways of looking at the data, it seems as if the hypothesis is not true. However, if I look at the data from a somewhat different point of view, the opposite is the case. So what I'm saying is, the primary driver behind all good research, don't put your emotion behind what you want to find. Put your emotions about, given what I'm investigating, is this interesting? So again, go back to the science. They say, here are the research issues. This is what I plan to do. And then they write up, in my mind, this is what I interpret in terms of how the real world is working. So otherwise you put yourself in a bind. In other words, you sort of, this is what happens to most people. And it's predictable. Sometimes people come in and say, I'm going to do this and that. And I tell you, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to start to run your aggression and you're going to be disappointed. Then you ask yourself, how do I get out of my disappointment? Maybe, Professor, you can tell me what should I do to get the results I want? Yeah, I can do that. But it's boring. Setting aside the ethics. So that's sort of the best advice I can give. Ask questions which are sufficiently interesting that what do you find, X or Y? You don't care. What you want to do is to have a thorough documentation that's careful, shows that you've been careful with the data, and then you're right. This is what the data tells me. This is what it tells me. You can't create excitement. If you want to go to the excitement, watch a movie. Research is a different animal. It can be exciting, but not in the sense of pushing buttons. It's that you get something that you really remember. So there are many examples. There are many examples of this. Okay, bro. Uh, so then we can move to the next question, bro. Yeah. Next question from uh, one of the participants, um, Mrs. Rohmi Vitayanti. Uh, hypothesis statements should be based on theoretical foundation and justified prior research, how that hypothesis is categorized as a far fetch, as you mentioned in your yes. slide. 
when we want to give any novel to, to our research? I, I like that question very much. It's a very good question. It's a natural question. Moreover, I think you often get deceptive answers. So let me answer the following way. To some extent, this reflects my old experience. So bear with me, so bear with me. It is often taught in academia that we have all our guys who do theory. And they have all of these Greek symbols, alpha, betas, and God knows what. And then you have empiricists and they check up if the theory works. That's how we teach it. And people who write doctoral theses, they have a theory part and empirical. And that's what we're supposed to do. And nowadays, many people still think you have to do that way. Now ask yourself, if you read much research, what did the papers look like that you found interesting? No theory. And I belong to that school. And the way it works is actually a little bit subtle. You motivate research because you know something about the real world. So a very simple example would be that I happen to study equity valuation. And I want to make sure, does it make sense to say that the forward P correlates with growth? What should be the growth measure? Why? Because that's what the real world is all about. Too significant to review it. So that's what I worry about. That's motivating. So the motivation behind theory should be grounded in human experience on the ground. So for example, if you take pay and performance, it is not grounded in, in theory. It's grounded in human experience. Now it turns out, and that's the subtle issue, to make things interesting, you need a little bit of twists and turns. And to communicate that, to make it interesting, theory really helps. So when you deal with risk, you don't test the cap then. What you do is, is that you're always aware, lurking in the background, if I talk about risk or ideas related to the cap then. But, so that means that in some sense, good understanding of theory, it's a little bit like a secret weapon. I can make things more interesting. Even though when I write the paper, it's as, I don't refer to the, it in any concrete ways. It's sort of a bit the, I, from a theory, I know how I can think about the real world. I know how to articulate the real world, but I don't really have to replicate these alphas and betas and all the fancy stuff. So there is room for theory. Most theory is not very useful, but the key thing is I think it's a mistake to say, because that's what we often tell you when you start our business, find a theory and test the theory. No, it is not the right way of going. So I hope that answers my perspective on the question. Your, what you should be doing, ask yourself, what papers have I read the last few years that I found interesting? That sets the stage for what you want to do. Am I clear? So for example, just to give you some example of some famous paper, like Basu's paper on conservative accounting. I found that interesting. I think the questions were very interesting, but it's not because he was testing the field. You test things that are grounded in common sense, common experience, reading the newspapers. You don't want to be fancy, but theory is very helpful. Helpful is not the same thing as testing the theory or, or elevating the theory. Sometimes you can elevate the theory because it shows that you're real academic but it will make the paper less interesting. Okay, Prof, uh, we still have uh, three questions left here. Uh, now I read the next question uh, from Mr. Yulita Satyawanta. The question is, should the control variables control the dependent variable? Mm? Uh, the control variable is not the main problem posed. Still, in the regression equation, it contributes to R square as if R square does not reflect the central question posed. This is the perspective from. I'm not the, sure what that question is. The, the key thing is, is that 
I think what one thing is, is if I have a low R square, does that mean I'm not on track? That's wrong. Oh, okay. R square, I mean, that's not, that's not, that doesn't tell you anything why you're per se. There are many regressions with very low R squares and it's perfectly fine. There are many regressions with very high R square because it depends upon everything, so to speak. But the issue is that if you want to understand data, it really helps to say, I'm really interested in how X and Y connects. If you run a regression with Y, X and controlling variables, it's a natural question that people ask, how does your regression change if you delete the variable? Now, it may be the case, just spell it out, that we should not expect that much to happen, but it's still very interesting. Give me the reasons. All I'm saying is, don't suppress important information. Just because it makes you uncomfortable doesn't mean that you can leave it out. And what my argument is that uh, that's what you should do. And that's what I'm saying here is that if you start out with two variables, give me an extensive analysis of how they correlate the two variables. It takes time. You have to be careful, non-parametric, some con basic conditioning and whatever have you. Then we move from there. So that's the key thing. But we do have plenty of regressions with very low R square, which some people would argue are interesting. The best example uh, is some, uh, some models that explain future returns and whatever have you. But you have to be honest and forthcoming. That's the key thing. Both forthcoming. And just because you have some modes of analysis that gives you things that you don't like to talk about, you can't do it that way because then you're not forthcoming. And the way out of it is if I ask an interesting question, I don't have to care what I find. I'm just trying to explain to you. I have this interesting question here and this is what the careful analysis shows. This is what it shows, but that's not the spirit. People come up with far-fetched hypotheses and then they want to reject the null. It's not going to work. By the way, if I may conclude this kind of thing, is, is that they have the same problem in uh, much of medicine. So you have sort of idea that if you eat fruits, you're much more likely to die to get cancer and stuff like that. So we do this endlessly. They have the same problems as we do. But the reality is, is that you have to go beyond p-values, and then you go beyond p-values, and then they arrive at a conclusion, as you, uh, your need is always emphasized. There's not much going on here. There's not much going on here. That's often the case. It's not much going on. Okay, Prof. Uh, that's uh, the response from Prof. Alson, and we move to the next questions here. Uh, next question from F.D. Undip. And let's assume that 50% of the published paper were false. Will meta-analysis based on the finding of those researchers have to figure out the real story of the relationship between variables? No, I didn't, I didn't quite get the, I heard the part that, let's assume that 50, but more than papers are, are false. Then what? Then uh, if we, going to make a meta-analysis based on the finding of those papers, yeah, is that have to figure out the real story of the relationship yeah, no, between I mean, it's sort of a mess. In other words, now you get into playing politics in academia. You, you could sort of just cite it as a curtis citation and then you just neglect it. So there are many strategies Usually, in our business, people are very sensitive. They don't like to see claims that what you're doing does not hold up. And like that. One thing you can do, which is risky, is that you skip references. You pretend that the papers do not exist. Yeah. But you hurt feelings then. And payback time may come. So that's sort of a, it, it's a tricky strategic issue. Most paper, what they do nowadays is, is that 
I don't know if you noticed, there are almost always about 75 sites. Have you noticed that? Yeah. That means that there is enough room to put in all sorts of bullshit. Stuff that you don't believe in. But there are different ways of doing it. You could say something which is very polite and yet suggest that, that sort of that your understanding of it is, is that this doesn't hold up uh, if you do these kinds of analysis. So you can be very polite to. The key thing is, is that, again, you have to play politics. You play a little bit of games. Don't ever fool yourself. The problem people have now is that it's natural. As a young person, you join a doctor program. So you're supposed to buy into it. It's also wonderful. All my colleagues and senior faculty are so clever. The papers I read are brilliant. None of that is true. We don't live in a perfect world. And in fact, it's more decayed than we like to think. So what I'm saying is, is that when you read a paper, read it critically, carefully, and maybe you arrive at a negative conclusion or a positive conclusion, be prepared three, five years later, you may change your mind because you have more experience. So maybe what the paper that you used to think was good is no longer valid or conversely, all of that is fine. So that's in my mind that my advice is that the reality is you have to resolve yourself, given your skills and what you try to accomplish, your sense of ethics and whatever have you. But you've got to have an understanding of that we live in a very limited environment. And the real peculiar part that's always lurking in the background is the fact that there's very little demand for what we're doing. You don't see our research cited in the real world, let me, let me tell you. Except I'm in the evaluation theory and managerial accounting. But just look at the papers you have to read. Ask yourself, why is this paper interesting? Most of the time, if you ask the person to the, sitting to the left of you or the person sitting to the right of you, they don't find it interesting either. But if they do, try to find out why do they think differently than what I do. Have a serious discussion. You think this is a bullshit paper? Why? You think this is a good paper? Why? That's where the action comes. Which sort of makes our business a little bit fun. Okay, Prof. Uh, maybe uh, it is connected also with the next question here. But in the opposite uh, situation here, uh, dear Prof. Alson, if the paper in a journal are presumed correct, yeah, mm -hmm. this is good question. Uh, I repeat again, if the paper in a journal are, pre are presumed correct to be correct, you said that cite but do not complain. What is the meaning of that statement? How to figure out? If the what the you have eight journals and they publish papers. Yes, mostly we expected to presume things are correct. Yes, and? Yes, then we just uh, cite, but do not complain. What is the meaning of that? Are you referring to a technical question? Uh, no, just, I just uh, read the question here from Ms. Mrs. Annie Susilawati here. Yeah, I can't wrap my head around what the issue is. Yes, and the issue the is to be... understand. It is yeah. true that in most journals and preeminent pre journals, the work is supposed to be good and pristine and valid. That's the premise of the question, if I understand it. Now, what is the question? Yes, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it should we have to uh, check again, yeah? Or we just to cite without um, take more action? Yeah, um, no, I mean, it's, it's sort of a, it's a practical issue. You do what you have yes. to do to publish if that's what you want to do. But in okay. general, what people do is that they have 75 citations. Three of the four of the papers we cite are actually important. Most of it is totally unimportant. 
Okay. So that's what people do. You know, in other words, there's a peculiar thing is, is because we can't do things that makes us all look good or look bad. But we have to be aware of that very many things we're doing that doesn't look good. So again, that's why, why I attached this document called Elephants in the Seminar Room. These are the yeah. questions that everybody, quote, tend to be aware of, but nobody can talk about it. So read the document. Okay, Prof. Uh, we still have uh, two questions more here. Yeah. Uh, next is question from Mr. Mrs. Teresia. Uh, it's related with the hypothesis statement. How should a hypothesis be made? Is it true that the basic hypothesis is the study of theory, logical thinking, and empirical support? If this does not exist, it will be considered nonsense. What? Yes, I think. If I, this, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. What if this research is new? And does it have to go through all uh, preposition first, and then from hypothesis for the next research? Well, the, again, this I think this is I think this is a very good question to the extent I interpreted it properly. And yeah. otherwise, we would have to start over. But the following seems to be the issue. It's an important issue, and I therefore I like the question. And that is, how do we state research questions? On the one hand, it can be on a fairly abstract level. In other words, people introduce fancy nouns, fancy words. So they talk about if people get overpaid, then the information they disclose is of lower quality. That means that you, you use a language which is general rather than specific. That's one way of posing hypothesis. It makes you sound like an academic. Very good. It's sort of fancy nouns, no, abstract nouns and fancy, ver fancy verbs. The alternative, of course, is that you say something which is extremely concrete. So I could sort of say that companies with high book to market ratios also have high sales growth. Hypothesis. That means I only have, a then that means I'm down to descriptive statistics. So you have a range on the one hand you have abstract language leading to hypotheses. On the other hand, you have extremely concrete language, which reduces the statistics, statistics, and then that gives you hypotheses. So you find the full range. One range has the virtue, this is that you sound academic and fancy. Wow. The other one is the virtue is you could put your arm around what they're doing. What you see is what you get. Do companies with high market to book have higher sales growth? This is the question. And I put out some sites and says, yeah, yeah, what you see is what you get. My argument for years is that simplicity is a tremendous virtue. And I don't know how many of you heard of the famous Einstein quote, make it as simple as possible, but no more. It's due to Einstein, it's very famous. Yeah. So that's what, in my mind, what you try to do. You try to take very simple and concrete things, and then you try to make it interesting. To try things to make things interesting or justifiable because you use fancy nouns or abstract nouns and fancy verbs. In my mind, does not work. So I have an expression and you can write it all down. Fancy nouns and fancy econometrics leads to fantasies. You use fancy language, you use fancy econometrics Trust me, it will collapse. Trust me. If you have skills, you can make it look as if it doesn't collapse. 
fancy nouns and fancy econometrics leads to fantasies. It's a very strong proposition. And in the good old days, what I used to do is, is when we have people coming in the job market, I listen for the first 10 minutes. And depending upon how many fancy words, abstract nouns and whatever have you use, I forecast how much trouble we're going to have later. So you can stick to concrete things. And then you go from there. I always try, when I review my writings, I always ask myself, I don't want any fancy nouns. Everything has to be the simplest possible language. And when it comes to nouns, you all know what a noun is. Use concrete nouns. Use concrete yeah. nouns. So if you want to talk about agency theory or the agency costs, I've never seen any goddamn agency costs in an in income statement. So what do you have in mind? Well, this is what I have in mind. Well, why don't you use this concrete language? That's sort of what you do. Concrete language makes you make humble. Moreover, people would understand what you say. You know what happens when you people understand what you say? You get pushbacks. The people don't care about what you're saying because it's too lofty. You get no pushbacks. Why? Because people don't give a care. They don't care. That's what happens. Make no mistake. Basic things said in a concrete fashion, you get pushbacks. But you can get pushbacks for the right reasons. I don't really have that much. This is not that interesting. It's not that new. But at least people understand what you're doing. That's the strength of it. It's a necessary condition to do something worthwhile. The necessary condition is that it's concrete and simple. Okay, That's so what you face up to. <laughs> simple and concrete things lead to pushbacks. All well-known papers that you're familiar from finance, economics, and accounting in general are very straightforward. Guess what? These papers were often rejected and they have lots of pushbacks. Well, that's how the world works. Yeah, and I like your explanation just now. I agree with you, Prof. Make it a simple and concrete way. Uh, in other words, it should be parsimonious. Okay, Prof, uh, we still have one question left here. Yeah, a question from uh, Mrs. Andri Prastivi, uh, researcher has tendency to make a false positive finding. Uh, uh, slower, then, slower, please. Uh, researcher has tendency to make a false positive finding. To what extent the research, researcher judgment during statistical analysis can be false as unethical? that lead to unwarranted conclusion? Yes, yeah, so this is the question of ethics. Yes, this is the question about ethics. But ethics and, is usually yeah. an internal matter, but often, often people cannot tell anything for sure. And then often you have four or five co-authors. The way things tend to work is someone does something and he or she knows it's dubious, then they pass it on to their co-authors. The co-authors, they just like lawyers. I'm not going to get to the bottom of this. I'm not going to ask nasty questions. So that means things get hidden and so forth. And if you think about my this slide I had, no, here, four papers, each or every paper here has many co-authors. There's one, one paper there, at least in this pile. But I found it laughable, laughable because no serious people could do it. So if you have something that's far-fetched and you claim that you have a clear finding where all robustness tests worked out and everything is just kosher, my guess is the probability that it's some lack of ethics involved is very higher. I don't argue about it. I just put it in my head if I care about it. And then I move on with my own problems. But if you engage in unethical behavior, do not think that in the future publication is all I need. 
I think it's going to be tougher in the future. We've been far too lenient. But make no mistake, there are famous papers which in my mind clearly have a touch of lack of ethics. The best example is, is uh, the famous senior faculty member at Chicago, Lloyd, Christian Lloyd. Hmm, I read the paper. No question that these conclusions are very far-fetched. I think I can tell what he's been doing. I think he knows that it's far-fetched, but we cannot be sure. I mean, it's sort of a little bit like when you have a very rich neighbor. If you have a very rich neighbor, you wonder why he or she is so rich. <laughs> Same thing. Huh? Am I right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our business is the same. Okay, Prof. Uh, next, uh, since we already uh, answer all the questions from meeting chat, maybe uh, we have a few more minutes left. Then uh, I can give uh, one more question from the participant that uh, any one of you that would like to post uh, any question interactively directly to the Prof. Olson, maybe? I offer this opportunity. Only one question from all the participants. Any, any of you? Can I have one question, Bob? Okay, uh, please, uh, Dr. Fuad. Okay, uh, Prof. Olson, regarding the whole out samples, and you regarding what? Regarding oh, wow. the holdout sample, the holdout, the holdout sample. Oh, your holdout sample. Yes, yes, hold yes. Out. Yes. Uh, uh, is it? Uh, can that uh, will it deteriorate the robustness of the findings, Prof? Uh, because if we use the testing samples, all the testing samples, and not the holdout samples, and uh, will it be used? in order to test the hypothesis. How, yes. the, how the hypothesis uh, is used to test the, how the, how, how the holdout samples will be used to test the hypothesis? The holdout, the key thing is, is that, it's very simple from a following point of view. Statistics teaches you that you cannot overfit the data and use the data over and over. The problem as a researcher is, is what should be my core test all about? We don't know. So we have to do a little bit of playing around with the data. Once we do that, we learn about the real world, but we cannot test hypotheses. So the idea of a holdout sample is, is that you get to estimate your regression. And you can, if so wish, look at the T statistics, but you only get to do it once. Once. Okay. So in the science, it's a way they work. Is they're more flexible. But the key thing is that if people are interested in what we're doing, they go to run the experiment again. So if you think about here, is this that the, you know the this paper I'm cited here on uh, page three. In other words, other people can check up. And here's the deal, my friend. In the future people are going to start to go back to studies. Now another 10 years have passed. And then they check up. If I, if I evaluate this hypothesis on the basis of data that's been available for 10 years, which is not part of a data set in the published paper, will I get the same thing? Again and again and again, people, when this happens, they're going to find, no, I'm not getting the same thing. I see. I see, I see. And I it's see. just a matter of saying that more broadly speaking, if I use these procedures, it would be very hard to find this outcome unless, unless in fact, the null should be rejected. So, I, so let me give you a very simple example. You want to correlate X and Y. You know what I do? Hmm. I correlate X and Y for each and every year. I look at 15 years. If I find that for all 15 years, the correlation is positive, I say, yeah, there's a positive correlation here. It makes me comfortable. 
you're not going to find a, a positive correlation for 15 years unless there is a real correlation here. I'm comfortable that if I wait another 50, 15 years, I'm going to do the same thing. Think about Morgan and Brown. It was done in 1966. Now visualize 10 years passes, 20 year passes, 30 year passes. Do you expect to get the same thing? Yes, you do. Do you get the same thing? Yes, you do. I see. All right. That's the key. It is not complicated. It's common sense. I always advise people, don't read any econometrics. Don't read any statistics. Ask yourself if my life hinged upon getting things right. And I didn't know much statistics. What would I do? Then you are going to end up with a good paper. It may be a boring paper, but it would be a valid paper. And what you give the reader, what you see, that's what you're getting. I the see. problem with too many papers is, is that what you're supposed to see is not what you're getting. Hmm. Fancy language, lots of editing. And they talk about, oh, you have to, you have to correct for clustering. I say, screw you. Just give me the basic stuff here. I don't think much is going on. I don't think much is going on. And I'm not going to get fooled just because you do clustering. I can tell you have nothing. Just split the data. Do Pharma Macbeth. Check the change in R square. You have nothing. And when I say, if you think you have something, it's fine. But just tell me and show the readers that if you do certain things, which is just common sense, it's not going to be credible, your conclusion. It doesn't mean that you can't do it. Go ahead, publish it. Am I clear? Yes, yes. Yeah, I hope I'm clear. Yeah, so I mean, the idea with the, the, idea with the holdout sample is just standard science from the point of view that in the science themselves, they always replicate everything that's interesting. So you do an experiment in the US, then we do the same thing experiments in Switzerland. Do we get the same thing? We have to wait for the period, but what you can do is just to engage in having a holdout sample. You don't have to be a goddamn genius for that. You don't even need a doctor degree. And if you were really worried about how the real world works, you would do that without being asked. So it's amazing how uncommon. But it's not that people do not do it. For example, you see in finance, when we do marketing efficiency and nominal research, they actually do use holdout samples a lot. They try to be quite careful. So what I'm saying, it's not that it doesn't happen. It's just what's remarkable is that when people have certain far-fetched things, which seems to be dubious, then they don't do it even though they could do it. All right. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you very much. Thank you. Comes for free. And that's what it's worth. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Prof. Prof uh, I think we reach at the end of time now. We're running out of time. And we come to end the end of uh, our sessions. Yeah? Before we close, uh, maybe... Any closing statement from you, Prof. Also? No, not our, really. Our Again, I, I always see my role as here is, is don't do don't do what I tell you directly. Start from the beginning and ask yourself what is good research all about, and just start to work with a very 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 simple premise. What we're trying to make you see is not really what you're getting. Just work from that premise. Use your best judgment. Be prepared to change your mind. Talk to your colleagues about when you have a presentation. Did you find this interesting? Do you believe that the conclusions are valid? Have an honest discussion. Be prepared for disagreement. Be prepared for that in the future you're going to change your mind. So that means that you start to see realities more clearly. Then, as I always say, is now you're no longer fooling yourself. Then later on, you can decide how to fool others. It's up to you. So I'm not trying to tell you about what you should, you should not fool others. I'm just trying to tell you 
If you look a little bit closer, a little more basic things. Don't get stuck in chapter 13 in some advanced econometrics textbook. It's probably a waste of time. Don't worry about game theory. Ask yourself, what are the questions in the real world that we can address? What papers have I found interesting? If you some, find some papers interesting, why do you find them interesting? Why okay. do I find papers interesting? Do people disagree with me? Yes, they do. But it's sort of a, it's sort of this collective effort, collective honest effort, which is very interesting and worldwide. Instead, what they do is we create these hierarchy. So you start to get the feeling, I have to be obedient. It's so, it's a little bit like in some doctor programs, it's not that students do what they told. They want to be told what to do. Do you know that? Many students, they want to be told what to do. But go ahead, go ahead. I would never do. Instead, what you do is you work with tentative things and always be prepared. My thinking was wrong. I read them papers at the time, highly cited, very good. I thought, oh, very good. I changed my mind. They're not that good. And it's not that I'm trying to be humble. I'm just trying to be honest. <laughs> They're not that good. And if people come by my office and say, did you write any papers that you thought to be good? And I no longer think we're good. Yes, I can give you a list of papers. I'm not trying to be interesting. I'm saying is this is just an automatic. Of course, that should be the case. You do work that's not that good, but you don't see it at the time. So don't pick on other people, but just be prepared. But sometimes they actually know it's not that good. Don't get fooled. Sometimes what you see is not what you get at all, but the authors might have believed. So that's what you should be all about. That's sort of my final words, is that it's all overall, it's a mindset. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Yeah, best for... of luck to all of you. It's yeah. a horrible profession. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for your insightful uh, explanation about the way we should uh, make a good uh, research. We realize now that uh, so many things that we should do to improve our research we still have to learn a lot yeah, from well, you. I know, and... but the key thing is, is that people always tell you what to do. Yeah, yeah. It's boring. Okay. You have to find it out yourself and you have to pretend a little bit that you're listening and doing what we're told. But never fool yourself. Be honest. There is much stuff to me that's interesting. Okay. You see what I'm saying? But people want you to be obedient because that means that they think that you're ready to do their bidding. He or she says, oh, you're such a great scholar. <laughs> yeah. If I, walk we... into, if I walk into a bar and all the girls come up and say, oh, you're so good looking, I get suspicious. Maybe they want to get something out of me. The same thing in academia. Yeah. We Trust are kid <laughs> Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, thank you once again. Yeah. Enjoy uh, your day. Thank okay. you very much, Professor. Yeah. And stay away from a virus. Okay. Yeah, you thank too, you. Bro. <laughs> you too. Stay healthy, Professor. <laughs>